Edison Motors has built a truck, an electric truck. It runs on batteries. The batteries power the axles to make the axles turn. does that through electric motors. Meanwhile, under the hood, it's got a small cat engine that acts as a generator to charge those batteries so the truck never needs a charging station. It's a brilliant solution. So I thought, what better way to find out about this innovative new idea than to talk to Chase Barber, one of the founding partners of Edison Motors. So I set up a Zoom call with Chase, and this is what Chase had to say. There's a lot of excitement in the trucking industry right now about your new Edison hybrid electric truck, and it's built in Canada. And to find out more about it, I've gone directly to the source. I'm going to be speaking here today with Chase Barber, one of the two original partners that started the company, and we're going to get all the all the deets on the truck, as they say. So thank you very much for joining me today, Chase. I know this seems a little repetitious, but I think we're back on track. So there you go. Um so you at, at the end of the day, then does you solve the, the overheating problem and Carl Carl can go to work every day? Yeah, uh the overheating problem, we basically yeah, had to separate the rads. The other big issue is that drive line. Too much electric, too much torque, instant torque, blown out drive lines. Now we put some torque fuses in it and it works and it can go to work and it can drive. But if somebody pushes their foot into it, it snaps the drive line, still blows out that little torque, those shear bolts. And so it's not, it wasn't perfect, but it was a proof of concept. It's what allowed us to really prove that, hey, we can charge the batteries, we can do it, we can do some fuel mileage, like those, those kind of things. What we learned from there was able to redesign what we call the production prototype. Which which is Topsy? Is the yeah, production? Okay. Okay. Um how I, I guess you know you haven't had a whole lot to chance to to perfect it in the real world work scenario, but can you give me an idea of how long Carl will run on batteries before he, he needs to recharge? You get about two, three hours driving off okay. just batteries alone. And and does Carl fire up the generator when he senses that the batteries are getting low, or do you need to do that from the cab and, as a driver? Yeah, well, Carl was crude enough that, yeah, you had to do it from the truck. Like, the driver had to select it on and off. The new trucks, they have automatic on and off features. So Topsy shuts... Fires up automatically when the generator goes low. There's three ways you can do it. You can put it into manual off. In other words, the generator will not fire up as the batteries go down to let the driver decide what he wants his batteries at. He can put it into manual on, which will fire up the generator and just bring the batteries up to 100%. And then he can put it into automatic mode where at 50% charge, the generator will fire up, bring the batteries back up to 80%, shut off. This extends the lifespan of the batteries. As if you keep them between fifty to eighty percent, you're going to get a lot longer lifespan out of those batteries. Yeah, I've I've read that. In fact, I saw on your website. I was perusing your website, and it initially you had ordered a Tesla truck, and then just got basically tired of waiting for it and decided to build your own. But you've you've managed to build a truck that would be more suited to your needs. Anyway, you would have had to modify the Tesla once you got it, wouldn't you? have? Honestly, yeah, we were going to modify it. I yeah. saw the advantage of logging because you're going uphill empty, coming downhill loaded. You got the regenerative braking. I'm like, that kind of makes a lot of sense for logging. You, like, But then I looked at the Tesla semi and I'm like, well, that's not built for logging. So my plan was I was originally going to get a Tesla semi, rip the cab off, rip the hood off, take all the body parts out of it, and then get like a nice W900A cab and then drop that A cab onto the Tesla frame. And then we started looking, we're like, well, if we want to do a body swap on a Tesla, so it looks good, and we want to do all these things. Then we started looking and be like, well, how would we design the rest of the truck to be for logging? And we're like, after five five years, I put gave Tesla $25,000 for a reservation. I was the fourth person in Canada to reserve this semi. After five years of waiting, we started debating like, well, how would I do it? How would we do it? What would we do differently? And we just finally said, screw it. We'll just build our own truck. And you ended up with a with a better truck out of the deal than you probably would have 
getting from Tesla and then having to rework it all yourself. You, you oh, it sounds like you've come up with a like a super reliable, efficient truck that's easy to work on, and you don't need right. to be calling Tesla all the time. That's right. We started looking at it and we're like, well, Tesla likes a lot of priority parts. Those headlights are only Tesla. Like if I was going to do it, it'd be an off the shelf part, a standard round headlight that anybody can put in. And then I started looking and be like, well, if we take that approach, like I'd make it a standard turn signal where it's just a common turn signal. Start making everything else really common. And we're like, oh, well, if we're going to make our own truck and make it reliable, like that's the way we're going to do it. Yeah. And you end up, ended up with a better looking truck anyway. The A model Kenworth beats the hell out of how Tesla looks, but <laughs> that's just, just my opinion. So I love the old the old needle nose Kenworth have like a special place in my heart. Yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a big 900 A fan myself. So that was great big hood sticking out in front of you. Love I that. still like the I'll be honest, the 900 is nice, but the LW is still for me, like with the butterfly hood and the yeah, separate. I like the butterfly hood. I've got, I've got a buddy up here actually that has a butterfly 351 Pete and his hood is a butterfly hood and it's cool oh. look, cool looking truck. It's so nice because you can just sit on the fenders and like when you're working on the motor, you got a little seat and you can sit on the fenders and work. And, yeah. Know, he, he he put a, a 3406 in it and he says it's a pretty tight fit, but beautiful looking truck anyway. So Carl would Carl is producing gobs of power, obviously, eh? Yeah, it puts out about 500 horsepower. To the drives? Yeah, the electric motor puts out 500 horsepower. So by the time you do the reduction or whatever, drive line linkage, but. So it would, oh, like the gearing and everything would work for, for a logging application. You wouldn't find yourself wiping your feet because of all the power or the weight no, would contain no, that. What we did is I needed more power reduction. So the electric motor was spinning at a high RPM. And then what I did was I took an old Spicer four-speed auxiliary and I dropped that behind the electric motor and then basically stuck that in first gear. So I had the electric motor itself spins at like 20,000 RPM, which is way too high. I'd be doing like 300 kilometers an hour. So I reduced it further two and a half with the four-speed auxiliary and then ran a set of like eight, 3.8 rear ends in order to, and now it has a top speed of about 105. Yeah. You, you guys are like the like the uh, Elon Musk's of the North. You guys, you guys are virgin on genius here, building a truck like that. Know about that, we just I just listened to a bunch of old truckers and looked at the old trucks. Like I don't know <laughs> if I would consider a genius. Be like, well, how did you drive your truck? Well, I took an old Spicer four speed auxiliary and stuffed it behind an electric motor. Yeah, uh, well, necessity is the mother of invention. It sounds like you've come up with a. A really cool project here. When when did you decide that um, you should maybe think about marketing this thing? Was that always in your mind, or did that come along through the development of the truck? Uh, honestly, it, we just wanted to build a truck ourselves, uh, like for our own little application and kind of do our own thing. And I said what I was doing on social media, and it just eh, – Everyone, like I said, I'm going to build my own truck. It's not going to have any planned obsolescence. We're going to build it so that like, we can work on it, service it. It's going to be simple with off-the-shelf parts. And it's going to be, instead of just fully electric, it's going to have a diesel generator so we don't have to worry about the range. Like We're just going to build it like a freight train. And yeah. people liked the idea and said, yeah, that's the way it should be. And they kind of supported us. So, huh. Well, we got it. Like, well, can you build a truck for us? Can you build one? And I'm like, well, okay, it's we're gonna build it and we're gonna build it for everybody. And I guess we're truck manufacturers now. <laughs> <laughs> that do you have um like a trucking background? You're right in you're right in logging country. I was just wondering if if you're like a second or third generation logging trucker guy. Oh yeah, yeah. When I was uh younger, my dad drove truck, my grandpa he drove logging truck and my great grandfather drove log and truck. Actually, my great grandfather, when he was in the twenties, used to run a mule train up in the mountains. So, oh man, family's been in trucking since the days of wagon trains. I I kind of suspected that was the case, but and and you went to university uh, as well. You and your partner both are university graduates. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of where uh, where I met my partner. There I was in university. My mom said, "Well, hey, you should." You should go to school. I was driving truck for about three years, four years before university. And 
I kind of was on the fence and debating like, well, do I buy a house? Do I go to school? Do I buy my own rig? And now I'm like, well, I'll be honest with you. I was 23 years old, bunch of money. And I looked at it and be like, well, there's a lot of cute girls at university. Why don't I give that a try for a year? (laughs) Uh, And how did that pan out? Did you end up with one of them? Yeah, yeah, did pretty good. Did pretty good. Turns out if you go to university with uh, trucker money, you, you do all right. <laughs> it, I had a, it was a nice time of it. And no, I uh, I did really well in university. And this is one of those things that I got not to brag, but I got 4.0 GPAs. Like I had straight A's across the board. I did an economic forecasting challenge. Like I went to school for economics, economic forecasting challenge for the Bank of Canada. Got second place. And I got a job offer and they're like, well, we want you to come in and work for the Bank of Canada. And they wanted to pay me $45,000 a year. And I was pissed off because I was driving logging trucks in the summer. And I was going up to work in Alberta up in camp work doing moving drilling rigs. And I'm like, well, shit, in four months, I was able to make $40,000. Like I was able to make 10, 12 grand a month working as a truck driver. And now they want me to go work for a whole year after spending oh $80,000 to go to school, four years, all the study and all the effort, and I made a third of the amount I could make driving a truck. This whole university thing is a ripoff. <laughs> like I was kind of annoyed. So Eric, my business partner, he was in the same thing. He's like, man, I've only got a job offer for 40000 a year too. This is stupid. And I said, well, like, well, if we can make more money driving truck, why don't we take the little bit of money we have left over and buy a truck? And like, we went to school for business. We'll just start our own trucking company, use the business degrees to start our own thing. <laughs> so we pooled the money we had left together. We had about $10,000 between us. And we bought a 1969 Kenworth W900 uh, truck and trailer for $4,000. And we spent the last semester of university restoring this old thing. It sat in a farmer's field for 15 years. So we replaced the airlines, replaced the electrical, coat of paint, and we sent it off to work as a long logger. And then we bought another truck and we bought another truck and we kind of just kind of grew the trucking company. Huh. Well, well, Carl, I, I saw one video where you you had weighed Carl to see what he weighed. And I had to do the conversion because I... I'm an old guy, I think, in pounds, but it sounded like the truck came out to about 28,000 pounds, which was, I thought, was pretty damn respectable, considering I know you put heavier frame rails in it. It's got a bank of batteries. Oh, that that one's not Carl. That was that was Oh, that was 28,000 pounds. Okay, okay. So that's that's my confusion there. But still, I I was I was impressed that it wasn't heavier. You know, I thought, man, that's pretty good. Well, for example, Carl was 9,000 kgs before we started. So let me convert that to pounds. 20,000 pounds. Carl weighed 20,000 pounds before we started. When we were done, Carl weighed 19,600 pounds. So we lost 400 pounds in weight by doing the conversion. So by going hybrid, you actually lose weight. So you can, plus you get the benefits of payload, but it's lighter. Like the hybrid, all the batteries, the electric motors, are lighter than the traditional truck driveline and with heavier frame rails i mean the frame rails we're comparing app if you compare apple to apples like what well, truck that already has those frame rails so carl had still the original frame rails the original body everything was the same so it was a direct comparison before and after the mm-hmm. only thing we changed was the generator from the motor to a generator added the electric motors added the batteries drop one fuel tank. So the basic way to look at it is um, if the generator back end of the generator weighs less than a transmission, you go from a C15 cat down to a C9 cat. So you're losing about 2000 pounds in weight reduction with a smaller motor. The batteries add on about 1800 pounds and then you add the electric motors and then you drop one fuel tank for the same range because it gets about 50% better fuel mileage. So you need half the fuel. So all of the weight reductions kind of balance out to the weight you add. So it's a net neutral for weight. So you don't really lose payload capacity. That's, that's pretty impressive. That's, that is lighter than my 379. 
just oh, I, yeah. I, I was impressed with that. Oh, Kathy wants me to talk more into the microphone. Uh, so I see now you're you're kind of toying with the idea of putting a coffin bunk on on one of the trucks. Yeah, we were thinking about it. A lot of people are like, man, I like your design. I like the cab. Can you add a sleeper? So, yeah, our, our engineer there, draftsman or whatever you call them there, added a, designed a sleeper for it. And I, I kind of like it. I, I like a sleeper, so. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's there when you need it. If you don't need it, you don't have to worry about it. Um, especially now with the e-logs and all that. See, I've never ran a sleeper because I figured, ah, no matter what, I'll be home at the end of the day. But now that you got e-logs, they sleeper's not the worst idea yeah what's what's the has has the ministry of transportation seen your trucks or pulled your trucks over or had any issues or contact with them oh yeah we talked with them they sure like it yeah, do they they're oh yeah they, the guy that uh the guy that works there that we talked to is a real big fan of bringing the trucks back to bc and like well we can manufacture some trucks here they like what it does no we've had nothing but a a, a good amount of support We've got the best support we can possibly get from the government. They're staying out of our way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. That is the best support. And and no grief from the emissions testing people. Do you guys have that in BC? Uh, no, we don't actually have emissions testing. No, we have emissions standards we got to meet, but they don't actually do any testing in BC. Okay, well, that's kind of an advantage there as well. You're not I mean, missing anything. Gray areas, though, when it comes to this truck and that aspect for in terms of, of emissions so the law the ministry of transport or you know whoever the, the the people that do the regulation have defined it as a standby generator so they the registration on our truck says that it's fully electric and it has an onboard generator as a piece of auxiliary equipment now that equipment it's the generator is classified as a standby generator it only turns on when needed and then it shuts off it's not a prime power now the rules are you only need to meet tier three emissions as a standby generator, so no DEF. Now, how so the truck doesn't need DEF because it's just a generator, it's an electric truck. So it's we're in this weird gray zone that yeah, it's kind of a truck, but yeah, it's also a, just a generator as a piece of auxiliary equipment. And nobody's made a hybrid semi truck before, at least not in North America. So we're kind of in our own weird thing and thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you've got a unique vehicle there. Yeah, I mean, we can put tier four emissions if a customer wants it, but we can also put tier three emissions. Or you could straight up do a truck, and there's no law that says auxiliary equipment mounted to the truck has to meet the same year as manufacturing as the truck. So there's no rule that says you can't take a 3406 cat and stick it in there. Now, I'm sure all these loopholes are going to be closed here, but right now we're in a gray zone and Basically, the government's like, ah, oh, she's okay. We'll figure it out <laughs> once you start really producing trucks. We'll have to figure it out then. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like about your truck is that it doesn't have any emissions equipment on it anywhere, which has been one of the biggest problems with the latest trucks, like diesel highway trucks. It's the emissions equipment that keeps failing or causing problems, and you don't have to worry about that. No, I mean, I shouldn't say that because, I mean, they may come out and say, hey, you got to start putting tier four in all the traps you sell. Right now, we can get away with it. But the other cool thing is, like, even if it does need it, it's a generator. It, the generators, like you talk to the technicians and the engine manufacturers, they have very few problems as a generator because it's running. It fires up and it runs at one peak RPM. It goes up to 17, 1800 RPM, and it just sits there producing constant power under 80%, 90% load, which means it's always burning hot. It's not lugging down. It's not soot loading. So you're not getting the knocks. You're not, it, there's very little it has to scrub out. A diesel engine's actually really incredibly efficient at producing. Like diesel engines have naturally clean emissions when they're running hot and they're running steady. It's the truck. Cause every time you shift, what happens like you lose your turbo boost. You're, you got that turbo lag in between each shifting. You lose every time you break a gear and shift, you lose your exhaust pressure, which means you lose your air intake. And then you throttle back into it, which means you now dump fuel into the motor. 
but your exhaust hasn't quite hit out yet until the turbo boosts up with the exhaust pressure, you're now running rich. That's where you see that black smoke coming from. When you step on the throttle, you get the black smoke. That's what they're trying to knock out. A yeah. generator doesn't have that black smoke, so they don't have the emission standards, which is also why they let you reduce the tier three emissions because they're like, well, it's not really polluting anyways. Yeah. Huh. If, when, when the generator is running, how long does it take to charge those batteries up again? To 80%, so, say. If you're just parked, it takes about 30 minutes to give you a full charge. Oh, very quickly then. Huh. Yeah, it, if you're running it about an hour if you're driving down the highway while you're charging, because you're also using power as you're putting power back in. Yeah. Do you think um, you'll be able to get more range out of the truck as, as you continue to develop them? And I'll tell you why I'm asking. Yeah. I um California right now is just nuts with emissions problems and standards and equipment, all this stuff. And most of their produce comes out of California on out of state trucks. Like guys, like that's what I did. I would run in, pick up produce, and run out. And I thought a truck like yours could basically run in and out of California on its electrical power and never have to fire the the generator up even until it got back into Reno or something like that. Do you, do you foresee anything like that being possible? If you put in bigger batteries. Yeah. And that's all it would take. I mean, yeah, the more batteries you put in, the longer your electrical range is, and, but then also the longer you've got to run the generator for when you do go to recharge it. So we kind of designed it. So at the optimal size where we don't want to add weight, but we still want the 4C discharge rating of the batteries to get the horsepower out of them. So there's like a minimum size of the battery, but there's no maximum size of the battery. You're just going to be reducing your payload by the amount you increase your batteries. Yeah. And if you just want more range, because like if you want shorter dur or longer durations between generator running cycles you increase the size of the batteries. If you want more total truck range, you increase the size of the fuel tank. Right, right. Huh. Man, you've got a hundred interesting possibilities going on here. It's cool. Oh, it, it's, we had a big event last week where we had a lot of like man, like equipment, bodybuilder manufacturers, people that need, make concrete mixers, snow plows, everything else. And we, when we built this truck, like we built it as a logging truck. And then all of a sudden, all of these, like we had a big event like that. And suddenly everyone's getting excited because you can have like a vocational truck, like a crane truck or a back truck or a concrete mixer, things that can work on site and they can go completely on the site, work off of electrical power. So if you've got a crane truck, it can work strictly off the batteries for quite a few hours, which means now your operator can talk to the riggers and the swampers and the people working without having to talk over a diesel generator. It's quieter. You're not running a 15 liter diesel to just to run a 40 horsepower hydraulic pump. So they uh, like, it's just, it's really, really cool. And we're starting to look into possibilities that we never even thought of when we were really starting this out. So the advantages are endless. I, I could, you know, go on and on and on about the different applications of a truck like that. Just like you said, like a crane truck or something like that is that's, that's amazing. And, and so basically Topsy now is your first production model or pre-production model. I don't know what the term would be, but that's the one you would start marketing. Yeah. The Topsy is the one where we would feel comfortable now sending it out to a customer's application it works to the point where I'm like, we can say, hey, take this truck, try it out, see what you think. We could like, it's gonna be the version of the truck that I hope to be able to sell here once we have been testing and done the testing. Like there's no fundamentally large changes needed anymore. Well, that's good. And and the truck is being tested down in Georgetown? Yeah, out in Ontario. Yeah, that's, that's only a couple hundred miles from where I am right now. Oh, right on. You have to come out and take this thing for a test drive. I'm going to be back in a month. If yeah. you want, you got to drive this thing. Holy, like, I could not believe this thing. Like, I knew it was going to have more power. But we did our first, um, like, hooking it up to a trailer and moving some weight tests there last week. And this thing is, like, it blew me away, actually, for what it's done. Like, I've, I've played around in, like, a Tesla and a car before. And, 
But man, that torque is it like we were gross weight, a hundred thousand pounds, and it moved it like it there was nothing there. Like I couldn't tell the difference between driving this thing bobtail and the trailer. Like this thing acted like the trailer wasn't behind it. Yeah, just so much torque. Oh, that torque is insane. Like it's 700 horsepower, but it's 80,000 foot pounds of torque, and it was just gone. Like I I don't know how to describe like I've driven automatic transmissions and I hate them. I honestly I hate the way they shift. I hate the way they deliver power. This thing, even though it's kind of like an automatic, you step on the pod pedal and you go, there's no gears to shift. It's just it's gone. Huh. You gotta try this thing out. Like now that I've driven it, I want everybody to come drive this thing because it's like I let the one guy drive it and he, he drove it, hold oh, move that load, and he's like, he's like, damn, I hate this thing. And I'm like, oh. He's like, yeah, I hate this thing because now it makes my truck seem like shit. Yeah, uh, you've ruined it for him. <laughs> yeah, that's what he said. He said, he said, you ruined my truck for me. <laughs> <laughs> so how long will Topsy be in Ontario? When do you get him back? Oh, uh, probably going to be in Ontario. We think about three, four more months. It's Oh, really? We're really yeah, we're really going through the testing. Like we've got some big testing facilities that they're going to, they want to bring it out put it out on their dynos, their load testing. They want to put it in their wind tunnel, oh which gosh. I don't know why that thing is not an aerodynamic. <laughs> <laughs> Great visibility, <laughs> though. Oh, wicked good visibility. Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. It's kind of an ugly truck, but it's ugly like the way I consider an old, like, Pacific. They're yeah. not beautiful trucks. It's, it's like a log skitter. I would never look at a skitter and be like, man, that's a beautiful skitter. But holy, for practicality, visibility, we're able to work on it. It's fantastic. I, I I look at trucks and go, that could make me money. And I look at your truck and think that would make money. So to me, that's a beautiful truck. I, oh, I like show trucks too, but I like trucks to be able to make earn a living for themselves. That's right. That I I just want to be able to work on it, have it go out, make some money, and yeah, it's kind of the idea, the kind of the idea. Exactly. Do you think they'd let let me into Flowtronics and have a peek at that truck? If or that's probably more of a restricted airspace. It's a little bit more restricted. Like I'm sure if I bring somebody there, I can do it. But really, they're doing all of their testing. And yeah. Right now, they're breaking the truck, as they call it. Breaking so they're, after this weekend, now they're breaking it. So they're disconnect. They're causing fault codes on purpose. What happens if we get a ground fault? What happens if we engage this thing? What fault code comes up? Like they're going through. They're starting with all like the safety things. Let's have what happens if a high voltage wire rubs through? Do the ground faults close the contactors like they should? What happens if we get over voltage, under voltage? What happens if we cause this fault code, that fault code? What happens just, if we lose power to one electric motor? Just kind of pushing it to failure and trying to get the bugs out of it. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Causing failure on purpose to fine tune it so that you reduce the amount of failures in the field. So I told them, keep like, I don't care if I don't see this thing back till spring. The longer they keep it and the more fault codes they can find, the better product we have. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything that I, I should mention that I've forgotten to ask? Is there anything you'd like to add? Something I should know or the viewers would, would appreciate knowing? Or have I skipped anything? Uh, I'd like to add the part on the way we built this truck. And it's it's kind of cool because in the industry, it's unheard of to basically have a prototype or a, a production prototype within two years. And for the budget we did it in, like we did it for one and a half million, which sounds like a lot until you realize these big companies are spending billions, not a million. Yeah. One of our core ethos is off the shelf parts and right to repair. I don't want to sell $1,500 headlights that only are specific to our truck and a turn signal that only works in our truck. There, we went to CBS parts, fleet break, Talk to the parts technicians there. Their guys, they were fantastic. Like, all right, Fleet Break, what parts do you always have on the shelf? What parts never, like, what parts do you find have the most reliability? What are the most cost effective? And we just went to parts that they had on the shelf, took those parts, put it under the, our truck. We went to the electrical supply stores and said, hey, what are your most common contactors, fuses, 
control stuff. Give us those. That let us build the truck for, we didn't have to spend millions and millions and millions in r and and custom turn signals that are five, $600. Now, if somebody buys one of our truck, well, hey, that's a $40 turn signal. Go get it at any parts store and throw it in. Yeah, so nice. But we, we want people to be able to repair and service these trucks. And we're not taking the approach of, oh, well, this is all pri- pro- proprietary tech and you can't see how it works. And we're going to put mm-hmm. a big stainless steel box, aluminum box over everything, lock it. Nobody can open the box. Don't look what's in there. Don't see what's in there. We've filmed everything we've done. We've shown and be like, oh, yes, that's a Dan Foss control unit right here. And the thing is, like, I know some of these other OEMs, they're using kind of the same parts we're using, but they're under a big box. Yeah. And I don't know if I'm, if I'm allowed to say it. I can't say who sent it, but, like, some of the people have sent me things. And we're like, they've used the same parts from Dan Foss that we used. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's other yeah. parts on there that are common parts. Like, stop trying to hide it behind, but they want... They want it to seem fancy. They want it to seem like nobody can service on these electric vehicles. Oh, they're electric vehicles. They need specialized service. Like, no, electric freight trains have been here since the 1930s. Yeah. There's industrial electricians that can work on it. Like, I'm I'm tired of people making junk nowadays. Like, you can make electric vehicles, like, last a long time. Electric motors can last 100 years. Yeah. (sighs) No, it's... Yeah, the, the reliability and the serviceability of your vehicles are, are one of the best features about it. I think I think you've hit the market with these trucks. It just your timing is ideal, I believe. I I think the thing's gonna be a huge success. No, oh, thanks. Thanks. More than welcome. I, I should wrap this up, but I I, I wanna thank sorry. I, I wanna thank you for taking the time to talk to me. We had I've lost track of how many subscribers we had message us and say, Hey man, what do you think of this truck? What do you think of this truck? And and finally we just got so many requests we had to address it. And then when I started digging into what you were doing, I got more and more fascinated the more and more I learned. So great concept. Great concept. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. Like I said, if you're near Ontario, it's gonna be here for three, four months. You you ought to come check this thing out, take her for a little drive. I would love to. I would love to. Yeah, just just email us when when you're around and I'll, we'll go for a spin. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the invitation. Well, thanks again for talking with us. Oh, thanks for having me on. Like I say, big fan of your channel. Well, Have been for so many years. Thank you very much. I I miss the trucking. I I still enjoy talking and learning about trucks. You learn stuff all the time, and this for me is is a huge learning experience. So I'm dying to try it. I get that. I miss trucking so much. Like I love trucks so much that I decided to start my own truck. But what they don't tell you is if you start your own truck manufacturing company, you don't get to drive trucks. I imagine you're in the same boat since you're YouTube and everything. You don't get to just go and jam gears and like that's the worst part about all of this for me. You're a victim of your own excellence. Yeah, I don't get to do the thing I love doing because I'm doing the thing I'm passionate about doing. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, well, good luck with this venture. I'm sure it's going to be a success. Ah, thanks, man. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Take care. It doesn't get much better than this. Here you've got a truck driver building a truck that will satisfy all of the upcoming government mandates for emissions, yet it's simple in function without any of the problems that make the new trucks unreliable. That's the beauty of Edison Motors' new truck. All the simplicity and the functionality that the trucking industry needs. It's more straightforward, practical thought like that that we need in today's trucking. So thanks to Chase and the gang at Edison Motors. I was truly amazed at how they were able to build a fully functional truck, electric, zero emissions, that did not need a charging station. Stay safe, keep the rubber side down, and I'll see you on the backhaul.